I spend my days talking to young people. I just discovered that uh, <clears throat> there is a 25-year club at Columbia University, which is a way of commemorating the efforts of faculty who've been at the university for 25 years. I got a letter from the president last week saying that I just joined that club, and it's true. Started working at Columbia University in 1990. I have been engaged in research that has looked largely at HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases. And just to put my comments in the context of what's going on here, I recognize how interesting it is to have somebody who is not a doctor sandwiched between two physicians who've made some very interesting presentations that go directly to issues of personal health. I'm a public health guy. The difference between medicine and public health is important, and it's uh, very useful, I think, to make sure that we understand that distinction. Medicine is all about the individual patient, the unit of analysis, the things that physicians learn in medical school, have everything to do with ways in which to understand symptoms, history, ways in which the patient interacts with his or her social and physical environment, and understanding how all of those are indicators of whatever might be the clue to the presenting characteristics that bring them to a doctor's office in the first place. Public health is all about populations. It's about the community. Public health is not so much concerned about individuals. It is more interested in individuals in the aggregate. The most important discipline in public health is epidemiology. And the study of epidemics has everything to do with ways in which the physical and the social environment create possibilities for the individual to interact with some substance, well, some pathogen, some uh, problem that will ultimately cause disease. So I want to say a couple of things today about ways in which the public health concern with spirituality has a great deal to do with contemporary problems that we're dealing with. Right at this moment in history when infectious diseases are becoming more and more problematic. I'm from an age when, in the 1970s, a number of prominent physicians said that this was the beginning of a modern era when we would no longer be dealing with infectious diseases. As a nation, we'd be much more concerned about chronic diseases. And then in 1981, HIV AIDS shows up. And quickly it becomes evident that that rather optimistic forecast was really a huge error. Those of you who have some connection to Africa are aware of the fact that Ebola is one of those threats that really represents how much the modern world has changed, largely because what was once a very confined, very localized problem has now developed the possibility to become a worldwide pandemic. It is all connected to the fact that there is no place on the planet that isn't within a 24-hour flight of any other place on the planet. So once isolated conditions now have a means of touching us all. The hysteria around Ebola is a way of sort of understanding how much and to what degree we are no longer individuals living out our lives in isolation. We are part of a global network. And our connection to that global network has a lot to do with the kinds of things that are going to expose us to a variety of different diseases. I always like talking after doctors because my own family history, which has a lot to do with the kinds of things I'm going to say in the course of this talk, really is focused heavily on the ways in which we've been in medicine. My grandfather was born in 1875. He was the son of a slave, but he started practicing medicine in the state of Mississippi in 1896, having been apprenticed to a white physician. Back in those days, medicine was less about science and much more about a folk art. So the idea that a physician could begin his practice largely by learning it at the, at the knee of another physician, the notion that medicine was something that was taught to an apprentice, not something that was necessarily learned in school, was part of what uh, characterized my grandfather's early days in Yazoo City, Mississippi, where he started dealing with a population that had to confront the evils of segregated medicine. My grandfather, I'm told, practiced medicine for 62 years before he passed. The possibly apocryphal tale that mention of him is that he died within three hours of having seen his last patient. But his son, my father, Dr. Robert Fullerlove, Jr., graduated from Howard University's Medical College in 1934, and he practiced medicine for 52 years 
in New Orleans, where I was born, and in the state of New Jersey. He had a distinguished career. In 1940, he was one of the first African-American physicians to be on the staff of Massachusetts General Hospital. He did a fellowship there, which meant that he was one of very few black physicians in the country at that time who got training in medicine from Harvard. He was board certified in 1946 and was probably the third African-American physician in urology to be so recognized. And at the time of his death, he was the president emeritus of the North Jersey Medical Society. I was married for 25 years to my still colleague in crime, Mindy Thompson Fullerove, who graduated from Columbia's College of Physicians and Surgeons in 1978 and practiced psychiatry for many years before turning her attention to doing public health research in the field of HIV AIDS. I joined her in that work in 1986, so that means I'm coming up on 30 years trying to make sense of the impact that this pandemic has had, not just on the world, but most especially on the black community. My interest in public health is not because I've had so much training in the kinds of medicine that you're gonna hear described today by our speakers, but it does stem from the fact that I spent a great deal of time as someone who was engaged in the life of the community and engaged in community organizing. In fact, I think it's fair to say that over the last year, I've been very aware of all the commemorations that have marked real milestones in my life. 25 years at Columbia. But 50 years ago, in June of 1964, I was one of a group of young people, a sophomore in college, going south to the state of Mississippi as part of Mississippi Freedom Summer. Prior to having gone there, I spent a number of weeks in the offices of Dr. Martin Luther King as part of a project organized by the YMYWCA to bring college students from the north into the south to understand something about voter registration and all the community organizing campaigns that were being mounted then to get African Americans to register to vote. It's kind of great to be in a room where I'm not talking to children who don't recall anything of that era. But if you remember Mississippi in 1964, you know that Mississippi Freedom Summer was marked by the death of three of my colleagues who were murdered on the first day of Freedom Summer, trying to get African Americans to register to vote and thinking through the issues of what it meant to be uh, a citizen in a democratic republic in a state that was majority black but which restricted the access to the voting group to all the 2% of that group. Community organizing really taught me something about what it is that makes communities successful in coming against the kinds of challenges that segregated, segregation represented in the South back then. One of the most enduring recollections I have of doing that kind of work was ways in which we would come into a town intent on having conversations with the local population about voting, about registering to vote, and about where we were at that point in the Civil Rights Movement. And invariably, the first place we'd go would be to the church. We'd find a pastor who was interested in the movement, who might have been secret, been a member of the NAACP. And we'd talk about the possibility of presenting a message of voter registration in the church on one of the Sundays. If the pastor was open to the possibility and was aware of the fact that this might put that church in danger, we would do our best to try and organize, not just folk to think through the issues, of what it would be like to register to vote. We're also concerned about protecting the property. You may recall that in 1964, 48 churches were bombed simply because they hosted meetings where civil rights workers like me were having conversations with the general population about where we're gonna go and what we're gonna do. I was so impressed with the ways in which the church facilitated our work that in 1965, when I went back to Mississippi, this time in Natchez in Adams County. One of the first things I did was try to organize a meeting with local faith leaders to talk about the year after Mississippi Freedom Summer, ways in which the Civil Rights Act was going to transform the population and have a conversation with them about the future. What would it mean to the community to suddenly have registered voters who for the first time in the history of that state might make it possible for elected officials from the black community to take office <coughs> You may know that by 1970, Mississippi was the first state in the South to have more registered black voters than any other state below the Mason-Dixon line. And to this day, 
Mississippi has more <coughs> registered voters than any other state in the union. So what has all this got to do with health? And what has this got to do with faith? Well, simply this. The Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s and 60s was a function of a community effort that was organized by the church. In sociology, we use a term to describe what it's like when a collective is able to organize itself, deal with the issues that confront it, and come up with strategies to solve problems. The power that they share is typically described as the possession of social capital, not economic capital, social capital. The kind of power, the kind of resource, the kind of energy that resides in a network that allows people to group together, to talk to each other, to come up with strategies, and engage in the kinds of activities that solve problems and push progress forward. We call their efforts, when they are successful, an exercise in collective efforts. And the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s is a tribute to the capacity of the ways in which that collective efficacy moved mountains and changed the course of history. I remember we used to walk into uh, the homes of sharecroppers, and we would typically have a kind of a pattern. Mississippi at that time was a state where it was rare, as many of you know, to have a, an African American who had gone much beyond the third grade. In 65 to 70 percent of the homes that I entered, neither adult could read or write. We were trying to get them to go through a symbolic registration where they'd sign their name, and the signing of a name would indicate that I would register to vote if I could, but I can't, so I won't. But the signature was intended to have them register for something called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And one of the ways in which we tried to get folk to understand the importance of this was to enter into a little rap where we'd say, see that child over there? That child is the future of this country. That child, should it have the good fortune to grow up in a city where black folks are eligible to vote, might one day be the president of the United States. We said that with tongue in cheek. Some of y'all remember. Back in the 60s, we thought a black president wasn't going to happen until well into the 21st century, way beyond where we were in 2000.